Hi, Carol. Hi, Pat and Trent. I suppose Jim's there too, but. Roaming. Roaming, yes. We're on Facebook. You already did, right? Hey, Jackie. Hey, Ruth, how you doing? Well, I'm here. All right. That's a good thing. Is it time? <laughs> Not yet. We got a couple of minutes, I think. Yep. I have 10 and 43. <clears throat> oh. Hi, Ruth. I'm glad you got to go to Alaska when you did. Oh, Sorry I am too. Your loss. You ran. Thank you. Yes, I'm glad I was there. Yeah. State filing, it's there's uh, both of them right there. But the, oh, you're taking them out of there. Well, that was for us, but I'll put those in for us. Hello, Maureen. These are going in the federal filing. This was supposed hey, to be for us. There's the one I was going to mail in. Beth? Yeah, thank you. Green, stop sharing. Done. We, we need this. It's time. Hello, Tetra. And Bridget. And Steve. Wade. Seth. All right, looks like it's time to get started. Please mute your mics. Lord is with you. And also with you. And with you. You turn on the remote. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Uh, opportunities for ministry this morning. So this afternoon at 1230, the board is having a special meeting on Zoom. Um, please, if you are on the church board um, or if you just want to sit in, please plan to attend with that. On Tuesday evening at 7, those who are part of the prayer shawl knitting group or those who would like to be part of it are going to meet at Glenda's uh, for the first time in over a year to knit. Uh, Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock on Zoom will be our regular connection time. Friday evening at 7, <clears throat> excuse me, will be our Good Friday service. It will be a joint service with Crest Manor. Um, Joyce and I will actually be in the sanctuary with Jen and Zach, um, and she'll be playing the piano, and hopefully we'll have some other people in singing. So please plan to attend that online. Um, it will only, only people in the sanctuary will be the people who are part of the service. And then of course, next Sunday is Easter where we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Uh, that is kind of in the church, one of our two high holy days. And um, we are going to do a hybrid service. So that means some people can be here in the chapel with us and some people will be on Zoom. 
If you're planning to come and be in the chapel, though, you need to contact Kelly and let her know uh, because we are limited to the number of people that can be in this space safely. And we are gonna have to set up chairs and all for that number of people properly spaced and all. So you need to let someone know, or let Kelly know, let the office know if you are planning to be here in person next Sunday. Uh, those are the um, opportunities for ministry I have, but we also have a, uh, this month will be our ABC USA America for Christ offering, and we have a uh, video to show for that. One of the most common questions I hear is, how are we going to get young people into our church? This question is most often accompanied by looks of exhaustion, sorrow, and hopelessness. When I look in their eyes, I can see that they are hoping for an easy answer, but this is not an easy answer kind of question. It is a question that many of us have spent years trying to answer. Indeed, those at the Fuller Youth Institute have spent their careers researching faith formation and youth. In 2016, they published the book, Growing Young. This book signified the culmination of a study that involved 250 leading congregations across the nation. These congregations are all growing young, meaning they are bucking the trend nationally for church attendance of 19 to 29 year olds. What they found is that amongst these 250 congregations, uh, there were six common commitments, unlocking keychain leadership, empathizing with today's young people, taking Jesus' message seriously, fueling a warm community, prioritizing young people and families everywhere, and being the best neighbors. Because of the grants we've received through the American Baptist Foundation and American Baptist Home Mission Societies, we have been able to partner with Jake Mulder, who is one of the co-authors of the book. He has trained a diverse group of mentors. And these mentors are committed to, to shepherding small groups from participating congregations. The individuals in the small groups will have the opportunity to learn from Jake, from the book, from one another, and through conversations with participants from other congregations. As they learn, they will be given the opportunity to begin to explore what does it mean to grow young in our context. I'm so excited about this initiative. I, I'm so excited because it will empower people to transform their congregations, to share the gospel with youth in their communities, and to walk with them the long road of discipleship. In short, it, it's going to give us, as American Baptists, the opportunity to heed the words of Jesus, to make disciples. And we'll be able to do it across generations. She'll be louder than he was. I hope so. Hear these centering words. How lovely is the dwelling place of God. May our hearts become a place where God's spirit lives. May our words become bold words of God's love and grace. And may our worship be worthy of the Lord. Being Palm Sunday, we remember the hymn, Ride On, Ride On in Majesty.
Now for the call of worship. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of God's power. The spirit will keep us standing firm. Pray at all times. Keep alert and pers persevere. We will speak boldly the mystery of the gospel. Please join me in singing our Lenten hymn, um, My Tribute, found in number 46. We'll sing it through twice. To God be the glory, to God be the glory, to God be the glory for the things he has done. With his blood he has saved me, with his power he has raised me. To God be the glory for the things he has done. To God be the glory, to God be the glory, to God be the glory for the things he has done. With his blood he has saved me, with his power he has raised me. To God be the glory for the things he has done. Now for the invocation and the Lord's Prayer. Mighty God, your weapons are spiritual and your armor is true. Teach us not to be defensive, but to stand in the strength of your gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading today comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the dis discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, in singleness of heart as you obey Christ, not only while being watched and in order to please them, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. <clears throat> Render service with enthusiasm as to the Lord and not to men and women, knowing that whatever good we do, we will receive the same again from the Lord, whether we are slaves or free. And masters, do the same to them. Stop threatening them, for you know that both of you have the same master in heaven, and with him there is no partiality. Usually this is the time we take up our offering. I want to remind everyone to send in your offering in whatever way you can, online, mailed, carrier pigeon, any way that you can um, provide the offering that you normally would give, it will be received. Lord, you provide us with everything we need, protection, sustaining words, and a community of support. Turn us away from our own concerns and outward to those who need what we have to offer, all the gifts with which you have blessed us. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.
Okay, I can't. Can you hear what's going on in our background? An infestation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we have a bunch of busy bees. Okay, bees can sit down now. Oh. <laughs> have any of you ever been stung by a bee? Yes. Yes, it hurts, doesn't it? It hurts a lot. We've been driving before and a bee has flown in our window and we immediately stop and get it out of the car because no one wants to get stung. I'm sure many of you have been there as well. But did you know that bees are good? I see Ben over there. Ben, do you know bees are good for you? Yeah, sometimes they hurt, but they're really good. When you see a bee flying around, it's kind of cool to see them because they have this big fat body and these little itty bitty wings. And they have to work really, really hard to fly because they have a bigger size body compared to their wings. So they are busy doing work. And then the flowers come up. And I'm sure that a lot of you have flowers in your gardens that are coming up. We have some that are getting ready to bloom. They're just beautiful. And those bees use those flowers and they're happy as they work. In the scripture today, worded in a little bit differently in Ephesians 6, 7, it says, work with enthusiasm as though you are working for the Lord rather than for people. So Paul is teaching us that in everything we do in school, at home, at church, at work, we are to do it to glorify God. And I think that's what bees do as well. They're buzzing around, pollinating the flowers, being busy bees, but happy bees. And we can do that as well. Sometimes, yes, we can be like a bee and we can sting because maybe we had a bad day or something has happened to us. And we need to remember that we can be a busy, happy bee as well. And that we need God in our lives to remind us to be busy, happy bees. So if everyone would do our pinky prayer with us, Do I have my pinky prayers over here? Bop. Dear Lord, thank you for your word and for bees and their hard work. Be with us as we work that we may do it to glorify you and no one else. Amen. Good morning. So we are going to pray today a little differently. Um, we're going to do more of a prayer liturgy and there's going to be a, t I will speak and then there'll be a time when I say almighty protector. And when you hear me say almighty protector, your response will be here, our prayer. There will also be a point um, closer to the end of the prayer when I will invite you to speak the names of the people that you would like uh, prayer for. Um, and then it, it, that's, you know, just to speak the name, knowing that God knows what their need is. So would you pray with me at this time? We pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. In a world of uncertainty, our first temptation is to defend ourselves, our views, our perceived home territory. Show us clearly what it is that truly threatens us. Narrow-mindedness, selfishness, fear, and equip us to break down the true enemies of our soul. Almighty protector, hear our prayer. Show us the places where our short-sightedness causes harm to others, to relationships, and to our world. Teach us to stand instead in defense of the helpless, the less fortunate, and the persecuted. Almighty protector, hear our prayer. As we travel our neighborhoods, our land and territories beyond, open us to being transformed by the unfamiliar, the uncomfortable and unwelcome surprises. You have given us all that we need. Now help us to grow in faith and courage. Almighty protector, hear our prayer. 
The wounded are all around us, Lord. Victims of war, disaster, abuse, and misfortune. Take us beyond pity and into the front lines of healing and reconciliation. This day we offer special prayers for, and here I invite you to name the names of those that you would offer prayer for. You can unmute yourself to do that. Amy and yep. Michael. Peg. Yep. Walt, Kim, and Robin. The McKay family. Neighbor Jerry, who lost his wife unexpectedly. Cindy White. Pam. Joy and family. Beth and Dale. The family of the young girl that was killed on Dragoon Trail two days ago. Um, Dana Oliver. The tornadoes in the southern United States and the flooding in Australia. The migrants. The violence in Myanmar. Almighty protector. Hear our prayer. You are our protection, our comfort, and our strength, O Lord. Keep us and these prayers in your safe and sure embrace. For in you alone we put our trust. Amen. Our second scripture reading comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and have done everything to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with you, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Let us sing together this morning, Be Strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and be of good courage. Your mighty defender is always the same. Mount up with wings as eagle ascending. Victory is sure when you call on his name. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord. 
Lord, and be of good courage, for he is your guide. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and rejoice, for the victory is yours. So put on the armor the Lord has provided, and place your defense in his unfailing care. Trust him, for he will be with you in battle, lighting your path to avoid every snare. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and be of good courage, for he is your guide. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and rejoice, for the victory is yours. Be strong in the Lord, and be of good courage, your mighty commander will vanquish the foe. Fear not the battle, for the victory is always his. He will provide you wherever you go. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord and be of good courage, for he is your guide. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and rejoice, for the victory is yours. Our third scripture today comes from Ephesians chapter 6 verses 19 through 24. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known the, with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly, as I must speak, so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. Tychicus will tell you everything. He is a dear brother and a faithful minister in the Lord. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, to let you know how we are and to encourage your hearts. Peace be with the whole community and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who have an undying love for, your Lord, for our Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. So today is Palm Sunday and the final Sunday in Lent. Um, this coming week is Holy Week, and next Sunday we will celebrate the resurrection of Christ. But between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, Jesus engaged in some serious spiritual warfare, the kind of spiritual warfare that Paul talks about here in Ephesians 6. In fact, on Friday, we will remember Jesus' crucifixion, the day that the rulers and cosmic powers thought that they had defeated him. But Easter will show them that they were wrong. As we have moved through the letter of the, uh, to the church at Ephesus, I've invited you to hear the letter as if it were written to us, the saints in South Bend, Indiana. And I've invited you to ask some specific questions questions. God, what do you want to reveal to us? What do you want us to hear from this letter? And what does it mean to be the body of our Lord Jesus Christ here and now? We have heard the promises that because of love, God has saved us by grace through Christ, created us for good works, gifted us with the Holy Spirit, and rooted and grounded us in love. In response, God has called us to live lives worthy of the calling to which we have been called, celebrating both the unity and diversity, which are the body of Christ, and living as children of love and light, which is our true identity in Christ, and submitting ourselves to Christ 
and mutually to one another. Now, sometimes I wonder um, why committees separated the scripture into chapters and verses exactly like they did. And chapter five and six here of Ephesians is a perfect example of that. The first nine verses of chapter six, to me at least, are obviously a continuation of the metaphor for the church, church's mutual submission to one another. But for some reason, someone separated the examples of wives and husbands from that of children and fathers and slaves and masters. But the same theme continues throughout this whole section, beginning with be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ and ending with, for you know that both of you have the same master in heaven and with him there is no partiality. Andrew Lincoln in Word Bible Commentary describes the message of Ephesians in three verbs, sit, walk, and stand. Believers have been raised up and seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Therefore, we are to walk in a way that is worthy of the gospel. And finally, we receive what we need to stand against the powers of evil. And that's what we're going to talk about today. After two therefores, we now get to a finally. Uh, at the beginning of chapter four, we read, therefore, lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And last week, chapter five began, therefore, be imitators of God. And now in this final chapter in the book of Ephesians, we read, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. In reaching the final conclusion of the letter, the author of Ephesians returns to themes of chapter one, one of which is the power of God and the powers that oppose God. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright has a great video on YouTube about what Paul means when he talks about the principalities and powers. And in it, he points out that sometimes when Paul uses these terms, he seems to be directly pointing to earthly rulers and governments. And at other times, he seems to point to some kind of spiritual power that is larger. He explains this phrase by explaining that God's original desire was for a wisely ordered creation and for that to come about through obedient human beings. God, therefore, wants good, appropriate, and wise governments, but those powers have gone into rebellion. Rulers, he reminds us, are merely human, not divine as the Caesars claimed. Rulers and governments are doing a God-given job, but they are also broken, rebellious, and even at times evil. Unfortunately, Christianity has a history of colluding with these powers rather than standing firmly against them as the author calls us to do. Mm. The church has had a bad practice of being in league with the principalities and powers. Haruko Nawada Ward in Feasting on the Word says this, and it's a little bit of a long quote, but I ask, invite you to listen. Um, it begins this way. At the Third Ecumenical Council of Ephesus in 431, two parties of Christians confronted each other bitterly, calling each other the tools of the devil because they had different understandings of the person and nature of Christ. In the medieval crusades, European Christian soldiers slaughtered Jews, Muslims, and heretics, believing that they were slaughtering the forces of evil. In 1492, devout Catholic Iberian crowns sent Columbus to discover the world while expelling God's enemies, that is, Jews and Muslims, from their domain. Likewise, Protestant reformers approved the state right of execution of those whom the church perceived to be its enemies, including Turks, Jews, Christian heretics, and witches. 
In the ensuing years, Christian Europe justified the conquest, colonization, and forced Christianization of those dark savages of the Americas, as well of the, as, as the enslavement of some Asia, Asians and numerous Africans using similar rhetoric. End of quote. And lest you think we've put all of that behind us, in the 1940s in Germany, there was a portion of the church that supported Hitler and Nazism. And this very day in the United States of America, there is a portion of the church that has aligned itself with Christian nationalism and the racism and xenophobia inherent in that philosophy. This struggle we are called to is a struggle deeper than personal temptation. It's a struggle against forces bigger than individuals. It's a struggle against the power of sin and evil, against the forces that corrupt humanity into something other than God intended. Forces of ignorance, arrogance, and hatred. In Feasting on the Word, Peter Ray Jones names names. Segregation, apartheid, fatalism, the mafia, addiction, bondage of the will, totalitarian states, serfdom in the medieval period, attempted bribery of legislators through large campaign donations and genocide, Nazi philosophy, unbridled nationalism, violence, hunger, racism, obscenity, addiction, brothels in Mumbai, nuclear weapons, and tobacco companies. Even we nice white people, as Austin Channing Brown calls us, collude with the powers when we buy into the cultural common sense, when we seek peace at the cost of justice, and refuse to acknowledge our personal privilege in the unjust systems in which we live. But there is a power that stands against these powers of evil, a power of life and resurrection. We read about that power earlier in the letter too. This is the great power that God put to work in Christ when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. Even though they are still active, the evil powers are defeated by God through Christ. They are dead men walking. Friday is the remembrance of Christ's crucifixion, a day the powers thought they were celebrating a great triumph. But the cross is the very means by which those powers are defeated. You see, points out N.T. Wright, the last thing the powers can do to someone is to kill them. That is their last best move. But God raised Christ to life beyond death. Even death has been defeated through Christ. Jesus took the worst that the powers could do, and with God's power, Christ triumphed. God's power, though, is not the power of ignorance, arrogance, and hate. The warfare God calls us to is not the warfare of bombs, tanks, and assault weapons. And I know I'm going to pronounce this wrong, so please forgive me. Le Chambon sur Lignon is a commune in South Central France, made up of primarily Huguenot and Protestant residents. During World War II, these Huguenot residents made the commune a haven for Jews fleeing from the Nazis. Under the leadership of the local pastor and his assistant pastor, the citizens of the village risked their lives to rescue and hide Jews in private homes, on farms in the area, as well as in public institutions. Whenever the Nazis came searching, the Jews were hidden in the mountainous countryside. 
after the war, one of the villagers um, recalled that as soon as the soldiers left, he said, we would go to the forest and sing a song. When they heard that song, the Jews knew it was safe to come home. The situation took a more tense turn when the Germans invaded the South Zone in 1942. Local people continued to protect the Jews in open defiance of the th authorities. In addition to providing shelter, the citizens of the town obtained forged identification and ration cards for the Jews to use. They helped them cross the border to the safety of neutral Switzerland. Some of the residents were arrested by the Gestapo, such as uh, the pastor's very own cousin, who was sent to Maidenet concentration camp where he was murdered. It's estimated that the people of this village saved between 3,000 and 5,000 Jewish people from certain death. The ethos and practice of sheltering refugees continues in the village, with migrants coming from many war zones, including Congo, Libya, Rwanda, South Sudan, Kosovo, and Chechnya. In 1990, the town was one of two collectively honored as the righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem in Israel for saving Jewish people in Nazi-occupied Europe. The war we are called to is not to wield a gun, but stand and put flowers into the gun barrels of military police as these protesters you see did during a march to the Pentagon in 1967. It's not to drive a tank, but to stand in the path of a tank, as this man did in Tiananmen Square in China in 1989. It's not to turn away or protect ourselves when we see others in harm's way, but to kneel in the face of evil and violence and plead in the name of God for the powers to take our own life instead of the lives of others, as this nun did recently during Myanmar's crackdown on pro-democracy demonstrators. It is to feed the homeless in city parks in defiance of statues that make doing so illegal. It is to place bundles of water and food in the desert for migrants regardless of the legality of doing so. It is to offer bottles of water to those standing in line waiting to vote for hour upon hour even in the face of a law that makes doing so a crime. It is Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey and confronting the imperial and religious powers at work, knowing it would lead to his suffering and death. Paul deliberately uses military imagery here, reminding us that being people of faith doesn't mean complacency or ignoring the reality of evil. In fact, he uses an image from the very power we are called to stand firm against, a power that people hearing the letter would have been very familiar with, Roman armor. We have been enlisted in God's forces to combat evil, but we go forth with different kind of weapons. We stand in defiance of the powers of this present darkness, encased in the armor of God, truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, the spirit, and the word of God. The language the author uses when telling us to put on the armor of God is the same language used in chapter 4 when we're told to clothe ourselves with the new self created according to the likeness of God. In other words, we are called to put into practice the new reality of our true identity in Christ and to proclaim the gospel of peace. And we cannot proclaim peace with violence. 
as Martin Luther King Jr. famously proclaimed, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. In the armor of God, almost all of the components are defensive, meant to protect the wearer. A belt, a breastplate, shoes, a shield, a helmet. Only one is offensive. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is the word that we speak, inspired by the spirit. It is the proclamation of the very gospel of God's peace. We do this by speaking truth and listening to the truth of others. We do it by recognize the difference, recognizing the difference between righteousness and self-righteousness. We do it by proclaiming that salvation is not based on who we are or what you've done or what prayer you've uttered, but it is a gift freely offered by a loving God. It's about allowing God's word to transform us instead of using it as a weapon to beat others down. Confident in the great power of God, writes Haruku Nawada Ward, giving up weapons of destruction, Christians are to move forward in proclaiming the gospel of peace. Wielding God's power also requires a different kind of preparation. Not firing ranges and marching in formation, but prayer and the building of community. Now, all the verbs in this passage are plural. And be strong in verse 10 is a passive verb, indicating to be strengthened by God. So a better translation might be, finally, all of you together, keep on being strengthened by the Lord. Brian Peterson of Working Preacher says that embracing the strengthening points to a lifelong habit of trusting God and finding life, love, and strength there. This call is not about being a vigilante for Christ, but about the church, community, putting on the armor of God to proclaim the pow to the powers of this present darkness that they have been defeated by the reconciliation and resurrection power of God writes Archie Smith Jr. in Feasting on the Word. In order to stand firm, we have to be nurtured in a tradition, a faith community, and grow deep in that rich soil. We are called to meet the enemy with spirit-powered proclamation and spirit-inspired prayer. We are encouraged to pray in the spirit at all times and in every prayer and supplication to persevere in prayer, and to pray for the power to boldly proclaim the gospel of peace. We must prepare ourselves inwardly and prayerfully for the outer struggle, continues Smith. The truth is that only God has and will finally defeat all the forces of evil. But this passage proclaims that properly connected and prepared, we will be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We will be able to withstand the day of evil, and we will be able to quench the flaming arrows of the evil one. The call of God's power is to stand up to the powers of evil while also surrendering ourselves to the hope, peace, and mercy of a loving God. And that is how this letter to the church ends, with a reminder of the gifts and identity that are ours. Peace be to the whole community and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who have an undying love for our Lord Jesus Christ. May that peace, 
love, faith, and grace. Empower us as we proclaim the gospel of peace. Peace between God and all of creation, enacted through the crucifixion and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. To the saints in South Bend with love, to all who have an undying love for our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Bob, we cannot hear you if you are speaking. Okay. Essentially, I overlooked. Yeah, yeah. Turning the volume up. Can you hear me now? Are you unmuted, Ruth? Yes, yes we can hear you yes. now. Yes. Okay. Okay. We'll we'll try this this way. Uh, Hosanna, loud Hosanna. The children sang through pillared court and temple the lovely anthem rang to Jesus who had blessed them close close folded to his breast the children sang their praises the simplest and the best from Olivet they followed mid an exultant crowd, the victor palm branch waving, the chanting clear and loud. The Lord of earth and heaven rode on in holy state, no scorn that little children should on his bidding wait. Hosanna in the highest, that ancient song we sing. For Christ is our Redeemer, the Lord of heaven, our King. Oh, may we ever praise him with heart and life and voice, and in his blissful presence eternally rejoice. With the help of Gary and Sarah, I invite you to receive the benediction. While we are a people who believe in the resurrection, there are days when challenges overwhelm us, when evil forces seem to threaten all we do and say. On those days, we rise. We rise to speak truth to power. We rise to live in God's righteousness and in right relationship with one another. We rise to share words of peace wherever our feet take us. We rise to strengthen our faith in the one who loves us. We rise to embrace the promises of God to protect ourselves against all hatred and bitterness. We rise to pray for one another and for ourselves. We rise to give thanks. We rise to boldly proclaim the inclusive love of Christ. We rise because we are Easter people. Go forth 
with the strength of God. Go forth with God's mighty faith and hope. Go forth with the boldness of Christ. Go forth with Christ's courageous peace and love. Amen. Amen. I would now invite you, if you would like to, to unmute.